So uh, welcome, thanks for joining us. The, uh, this is uh, one of several talks now we've, we've done virtually, and this is a outgrowth of an overview of bufferlands birds, and this is uh, more laser focused. Uh, I think we'll cover uh, something like 25 species total that we'll just uh, acknowledge but most of it is uh, going to be focused on, uh, on raptors. And I'll give a little bit of background, though uh, I know a lot of you already know about the bufferlands a bit. Uh, the bufferlands now has a species list of 245. Uh, we just uh, last week added a, a new species, a red-breast merganser. Uh, female or mature type. So, you know, the bufferlands is a, a fairly small area. I mean, 2,000 acres sounds big, but it's really not that big in the scheme of things, and it's pretty flat. It ranges from about uh, sea level up to just over 20 feet, and yet we have a pretty impressive uh, list of species, and it's really based on the diversity of habitats. We have, on, especially on the west side, uh, it's lower and it, it floods more, uh, both seasonal and permanent wetlands. And you can see some of the uh, permanent water bodies on the east side of the property. Uh, the Sacramento Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant is in the middle. And that's really the reason for the buffer lands is to provide an open space buffer for the community from the treatment plant operations. Uh, and it's worked out really well as a uh, as wildlife habitat. And you can see the setting between South Sacramento and uh, Elk Grove with Stone Lakes National Wildlife Refuge down um, adjacent to us in the to the southwest in Interstate 5. On the west, Franklin Boulevard on the east. And to the north, uh, some of that ag land is now filling in with the Delta Shores uh, development. It gives you some of the, the lay of the land. So tonight we'll be talking about these species, um, uh, raptors or birds of prey. And if you've been following um, birds for a few decades, you'll know that taxonomy has changed a bit. Uh, this is a screenshot from page three of our uh, bird list, which is on our website. And you can see it has uh, starts with turkey vulture and goes straight through uh, shorted owl. And then there's a bit of a gap where there's uh, kingfisher and woodpeckers, and then there's the falcons. And if you, uh, you know, took biology uh, you know, 30 years ago, you would have been taught about falconiformes, and that included the, the falcons as well as the as the uh, hawks and eagles, and then the um, the owls are in their own order. But we've since learned uh, DNA evidence has uh, shown, as well as some structural evidence, that falcons are are not very closely related to hawks at all. They're uh, more closely related to parrots and songbirds than they are to hawks. So it's an example of convergent evolution. But I'll get into that a little bit more as we go through the species. So some of our, uh, what I'm going to do is address the, the species, some issues of identification, and uh, the seasonality and a, and a few other uh, things that I find interesting. I'm going to try to get in uh, in about 40 minutes from now, be wrapping up, and then I'll uh, open it up for questions. Of course, I'm not going to get to everything uh, that, that is to be said about these uh, 25 or so species, but uh, you know we'll we'll cover a lot of ground. So. We have spring and fall migration, and these include birds that uh, pass through the area, most of them coming from the south and going north. Some stay to breed, and that's what we're talking about. We really don't have 
uh, species that of, of raptors, of birds of prey that just pass through and don't linger. Uh, so uh, some individuals, of course, do, but our uh, spring migrants, uh, like Swainson's hawk, will will stay. Uh, there are other uh, types of, of migratory birds that we could talk about, like the American white pelican, that don't breed locally at all, but do come in after breeding and, and frankly can be found. Uh, you know, they're very opportunistic with habitat. Uh, there are others like the red-tailed hawk that are year-round residents. Uh, that doesn't mean that they don't migrate. Uh, some populations are, are pretty migratory or highly migratory of red-tailed hawks, but others are year-round residents. But the point being here, the way I'm speaking of it is, you can find red-tailed hawks year-round. They're quite common in the area. And then winter residents. And these are birds like sandhill cranes, uh, says phoebe, uh, and moving into uh, raptors would be like uh, sharp shin hawk that arrive in the fall or late summer and then spend the winter and then leave uh, leave in the early to mid springtime, like uh, mid April. So here's an example. Here's a, a immature juvenile red-tailed hawk. You can see the bar chart. They're pretty common year round. And then a Swainson's hawk is uh, you know, quite uncommon uh in january february and then pretty common until they taper off um starting in october we're going to spend a bit of time on red-tailed hawk because really red tails are the jumping off point for the large hawks uh, i was recently watching a virtual talk with uh, john dunn who's the lead author on the uh, national geographic field guide and uh, you know he likes to say you know why isn't it a red-tailed hawk that's sort of your starting point if you have a big hawk uh, you know you, you kind of start with the assumption that it may well be a red-tailed hawk so let's let's talk about some of the features of this bird um, it's in the genus Budio and several of the species are in that genus and uh, we'll talk about uh, Three of the common ones, and then uh, a couple that we see less frequently kind of later on in the talk. So uh, first off, this is this is an adult red tail, or at least we can say it's a it's a red tailed hawk that's over a year old. They hatch in let's say April usually, uh, maybe yeah, April is a good a good uh, average, and then they. They look like that picture I showed earlier uh, without the red tail, and we'll, we'll see that photo again shortly. And then they don't, until the late summer, uh, molt. And molting in birds is a, the systematic replacement of feathers. So feathers wear out over time, and almost all birds replace all of their feathers once a year, and it's usually in the late summer or fall and uh, red tails are no different. So that's when they attain the red or orangey tail. But that's not a very helpful feature when they don't have it. So why else is it a red-tailed hawk? Well, a couple, a uh, few things to look at. Uh, one of the best features uh, that can separate it from all of the other similar sized hawks we have around here are these um, dark bars on the leading edge of the wing. These are called patagial bars. This, this region of the wing is called the patagium, but all you really have to know is this is a dark bar in the leading edge about a uh, little less than a half, maybe a third of the wing uh, is dark. You know, that's one thing to remember. Another is they have a, a belly band, this streaking, which creates a band and, and usually a, a white uh, chest or off-white chest. They also have fairly broad wings that bulge here in the secondary. So this is these are the primaries. These uh, come off the hand, and then the secondaries come off the arm uh, back here, and they bulge. So we'll we'll contrast that with uh, Swainson's hawk shortly. 
So here is another uh, red-tailed hawk that's over a year old. It has a reddish tail. Also has a, a darkish, uh, fairly dark eye. That's another feature that lets you know that it's a, an adult bird. You can see the streaking that will create the belly band. And another thing I want to mention is the uh, how the the back is sort of modeled. There's a lot of white or nearly white uh, feathering on the back. So these are all red-tailed hawks. And uh, this is a young bird. I believe this photo was taken in March. So this is a bird that say hatched the previous April, made it through the fall. A lot of young birds don't make it. So it's uh, once they figure out how to make a living, they can live over 10 years uh, and, and older uh, pretty consistently but it's there's a lot of mortality in that first year but this is a bird that you know made it through the, the probably the hardest time of winter so uh, what do we see here well we see that modeling again even though it's a young bird it has that similar pattern that i talked about on the adult uh it, ha it has a pale eye and then it has this, this barred tail uh it's not um not that red orange. And notice the, the wings don't come uh, all the way to the tip of the tail. Um, this, you know, sometimes angles can be confusing. This is also a, a red-tailed hawk. This is uh, probably a adult or near adult. It, it doesn't have as, as heavy a uh, belly band. But th these, some of these features like the pale back and the belly band are things you can see, especially with a spotting scope, you know, a mile or more away when they're perched. And again, you know, you might not be 100% sure, but you can be pretty sure when you see these features, uh, even if they're a distant speck, <laughs> that it's a red-tailed hawk because they are quite common and that this contrasts pretty well with, with other species that we'll be talking about. One of the complicating factors, uh, it's actually fun because they're uh, beautiful birds to look at. Uh, some of these uh, reddish morphs and more brownish morphs, but they, uh, the dark feathering will cover some of the things that we, we wanna see like that dark patagium uh, or the dark line on the leading edge is covered by this all this dark in the underwing. This one's pretty easy because you can see, well, it does have a red tail, so that helps. But oftentimes with the dark morph birds, you're left with structure. So you remember the wing shape we talked about, and this is uh, probably, you know, collided with something or, uh, you know, a branch or lost a feather here. But uh, they do have this really wide, bulgy uh, feather, and so uh, wide, bulgy wing. And that's that's a good feature to look at when we compare them to some of the other hawks. So here's a, a young bird again. We saw this picture earlier. It doesn't have a red tail. I've been on field trips with people, you know, red-tailed hawk, and they say, well, you know, it doesn't have a red tail, and you know, a lot of them don't, especially uh, in the fall. Uh, sometimes you see at least half of the birds uh, won't have red tails, but they do have the belly band and they do have the dark, uh, dark leading edge and this wing shape with the bulgy uh, secondaries and broad um, uh, kind of finger like uh, primary tips. So these are red tails way off in the distance and this may not compute uh, as far as seeing the speckling on the back, but the, the point here is there are different sizes. This is a pair. And in most of the raptors we'll talk about, the females are larger than the males. And it's pretty uh, noticeable most of the time. So now moving on to Swainson's hawk. Uh, similar, it's also a Budio, one of the soaring hawks, but it's a little bit different. It has narrower wings that come more to a point. And while the red tails uh, hold their wings flatter, uh, these have a slight V shape, kind of like a turkey vulture. And they're also lighter bodied, so they rock in the wind. Uh, they're not as steady in the air, again, sort of like a turkey vulture. 
And when they're way off in the distance, and sometimes, you know, as the warm air is rising, these birds, uh, these soaring birds, including turkey vultures, will circle to gain altitude rather than flapping along to get from point A to point B. They they will often uh, use the rising warm air to gain altitude and then glide to their their destination. It saves a lot of energy. But you'll see this, uh, what's often called kettling behavior. And sometimes there'll be a Swainson's hawk in with the, with the distant turkey vultures. And you can overlook it because it has a similar enough uh, flight style. So uh, what else about Swainson's hawk? Well, the lighter birds, the lighter morph birds, uh, have a pale leading edge, none of that uh, dark uh, patagial mark, and then uh, darker flight feathers. Now, if we go back to the red tail, um, you see even uh, in the dark morph, it's actually the, the leading edge is darker than the, um, the trailing edge or the, these, uh, these longer flight feathers, primaries and secondaries. But in the Swainson's hawk, um, you know, you have the light followed by dark. So here's a, uh, a Swainson's hawk that looks quite a bit, uh, you know, we get quite a lot of them like this. The population breeding in the Central Valley tends to be darker than the uh, populations in the Great Basin and in the Great Plains. And they're pretty widespread hawk, but the uh, birds that are, are uh, breeding here in the Central Valley uh, overall tend to be darker. Um, we do have light morphs here, but when you go, uh, and say you're driving across Nevada and uh, Swainson's hawks uh, you know, are flying over uh, the highway, you'll notice they're just, they're really light compared to what uh, we typically see here. So this is what's sometimes called a rufous morph. Uh, rufous is a kind of orangey red color. They're really a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful hawk. And note the really long wings, because these are more highly migratory than most populations of red tails. Some of them go uh, to South America to winter. A lot of them are wintering in uh, Mexico. And it's sort of a, uh, th these birds appear to be expanding quite a bit. I mean, our, our numbers are increasing. And they, um, really what's good news for Swainson's hawk is uh, there, there's been a lot of clearing of desert and, and uh, farming. And so it's, you know, bad news for those desert birds, but Good news for Swainson's hawks that really are, are, can adapt well to agriculture. And so they're using those ag fields in Mexico in the wintertime, and then they're coming up here and often foraging in ag fields and then uh, nesting in riparian areas or even in uh, residential or city trees uh, oftentimes. And they do appear to be increasing. Uh, they're listed as threatened, and they uh, drive a lot of the uh, open space protections. They're kind of an, an umbrella species uh, that protects open space. Um, so a lot of uh, what we do at the bufferlands, and actually I was going to mention, mention this in the beginning. You know, so we're uh, I'm uh, part of a team that uh, you know manages the bufferlands for for habitat, but also helps the sanitation district with uh, you know, environmental compliance. And one of the things that we do a lot of is monitoring Swainson's hawks and you know, figuring out the timing of uh, maintenance projects and construction projects uh, involved with the treatment of wastewater at the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, and so the Swainson's hawk is one of the drivers of that uh, environmental uh, compliance and monitoring aspect of what we do. So uh, comparing uh, red tail hawk and Swainson's hawk, again, you've seen that picture before, but you see that uh, kind of white checking, speckling on the 
scapulars and the uh, and the uh, wing culverts. And on the Swainson's hawk, you don't see that at all. It's just kind of this nice chocolate brown, very uh, uniform back. Again, long wings past the tip of the tail. Here's a uh, an adult with uh, two recently fledged youngsters. When they're young birds, they uh, they can be kind of hard to tell apart between them and like young red tails. They do have smaller bills. Uh, you can see they kind of look uh, look a little more delicate uh, than red tails, so the adult looks uh, pretty angry up there. So uh, yet another Budio is the red-shouldered hawk. Uh, it's a little different though. It's uh, more of a riparian and forest bird. It's not as much in the open country. The both the Swainsons and the red tails. Uh, and especially the red tail can be in a mix of habitat, but the uh, red shoulder is more associated with um, with trees, and that can be, you know, native riparian habitat along rivers and streams, or it can be suburban trees, uh, uh, and they're they're quite common, and they do really well around uh, our our habitat, human habitats. It's a beautiful hawk, uh, bright. Uh, really bright red, you know, it's called red shouldered, but it's really, it could be red bellied. It's uh, very red, uh, black and white barring on the tail. In the upper left, that's a, a juvenile. So same thing, you know, they, they look like that for their first year of life and then they molt into uh, the adult plumage. A similar looking bird, but now we're in a different genus. We'll come back to the Budios, but uh, the two uh, groups that I wanted to emphasize were the Budios, the soaring hawks, and then the excipiters. And these are the bird hunters, and they're they're uh, fast fast flappers. Uh, they're relatively shorter winged and longer tailed. And just going back briefly to the the red-shouldered hawk, you can see a lot of similarities between the two. But the uh, barring on the tail of the Cooper's hawk doesn't have it doesn't have white in it, and uh, it doesn't have the red extending onto the back. But superficially, there are some similarities, and the uh, red-shouldered hawk does fly like a, an excipitor. It has flap, 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 glide, flap, 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 glide, as opposed to you know slow, deep. Uh, powerful flaps like a red-tailed hawk does. So that flight pattern, that flapping and gliding pattern of red shoulder is also uh, something that you see in the in the excipitors. And you know this would be easy enough except there are there are two in our area that we regularly see. The Cooper's hawks are year-round residents and the sharp shin hawks are uh, just you know fall through, through early spring or mid spring. Uh, they're very similar looking. And if you uh, never see an excipiter that you don't identify the species, I think you're doing something wrong. It's, there's no shame in putting down excipiter spa, which just means it's a unidentified excipiter. They're easy to tell, relatively speaking, uh, get them to genus, but uh, if you don't see them well, or some individuals just seem to confound uh, identification. But these are uh, the two perched birds in a similar posture do show some things that are helpful. So uh, a lot is said and emphasized on the tail shape. And I think uh, it can be misleading. It can be overemphasized. But it is something to, to know that Typically, sharp shinned hawks have uh, squared off tails, and Cooper's hawks appear to have a more rounded looking tail. Cooper's hawks are lankier, longer, bigger. They're in weight, they're about three times the size, it's three times the weight of a sharp shinned hawk on average. Um, but they're, and they're about 11 inches to, you know, 16 and a half inches on average. One of the challenges, though, is remember the the males are smaller than the females. So a male Cooper's hawk 
gets closer in size to a female sharp shin hawk than comfort, you know, for identification. So sometimes, you know, if you flush a hawk or you see a, a little tiny hawk fly by and you can tell it's an exhibitor by the way it's flying, you know, that's a pretty good uh, ID mark. I'm comfortable. Sometimes that tiny little hawk has got to be a uh, sharp shin hawk or it just looks like a massive, you know, it's like, is this, could this even be a goshawk? which we almost never get down in the valley. Uh, that's another exhibitor. But, uh, you know, there are plenty that give you pause. And so a few other things on a perched bird, the uh, sharp shin hawk has a big eye. The eye seems to take up a half of its face, whereas it's much smaller and closer to the bill on a cooper's hawk. Cooper's hawks have a more angular head, kind of a flat, head and uh, it's black that contrasts with a paler nape and the sharp shin hawks has a more rounded head um, in flight uh, so the the two birds in flight are both immature birds uh, sharp shin on the left cooper's hawk on the right um, i'm going to move on to the next slide and then we'll talk about that a little more so um, the Cooper's hawk tends to look, as it's been described, as a turtle sticking its head out of the shell, and the uh, sharp shins, like it's kind of pulling its head back in, so it looks smaller headed. And again, uh, the Cooper, the Sharpie has the uh, squared off tail, and the Cooper's has a more rounded tail. On this slide, the four birds on the left are Cooper's hawks and the two on the right are sharp shin hawks. And uh, on the lower left, that's an adult Cooper's hawk doing a flight display in breeding season. So they do a really slow flap uh, when they're doing that and they fluff out their undertail coverts. It actually almost wraps around the tail. I've uh, been in the field where people have tried to call them harriers because they have a, you know, looks like a pale rump. But again, you don't want to focus on just one feature. Um, but you can see how uh, on that Cooper's hawk in the lower left, the tail looks rounded. And it's an interesting behavior when they do that, because normally they're flying really fast. But in breeding season, they do this slow, uh, deep flapping and sometimes are kind of cack cackle calling when they go by. So the bird up top in the middle, it was wet and drying out from the big storm we recently had. And you can see how the tail is, uh, might be rounded when it's folded. The outer tail feathers are going to be the tail feathers you see on the underside of the bird. They uh, fold in at the bottom. Um, and so, and they're shorter. You can kind of tell that they're shorter. And that's what gives the rounded look to the tail. Um, there's a Cooper's hawk at the bottom, a young Cooper's hawk, and unfortunately, I don't have a good equivalent uh, sharp shin hawk, but fairly fine streaks. Uh, the uh, sharp shin hawk uh, immatures or juveniles have a, a uh, more blotchy uh, streaking on the breast, which is often a little bit reddish where it's more brown almost blackish brown on the sharp shin hawk. But it's something that takes some practice. But, uh, you know, like I was going to say with the um, red tails, even in the beginning, is, you know, every time you see a hawk, even if it's distant, even if it's a poor look, you know, forming a hypothesis about what it, it could be, uh, you know, you start building up a mental, uh, a mental, a store of, of images and experiences that uh, help you, uh, you know, and over the years, you you can get a really good feel for what these birds look like and how they fly. So um, moving on to the Northern Harrier, it's our only Harrier in North America. And uh, another a feature that is mostly talked about with the uh, Harriers is the white rump, and that is a good feature, but it can be 
I've seen Swainson's hawks and Ferruginous hawks and others uh, in the field called uh, harriers because they had a whitish rump. So, you know, another thing, just think, well, it also has really long wings and a long tail. And then the, the males are gray and the females are brown. And the young birds look uh, more like females, but that bird in the, in the middle bottom is a, is a juvenile and it's in its uh, first winter. It has uh, this kind of reddish orange wash to the undersides. The, the females are, are kind of creamy with streaks, uh, so they're not, don't have that reddish color. And this time of year, you see a lot of harriers that have that uh, kind of uh, orange reddish tone. These birds uh, nest on the ground and they've, they've declined quite a lot. They're a, an open country bird uh, that, um, you know, unfortunately is declining. Um, they're not, they probably don't do great with the extended periods of drought and then just a lot of, you know, development of the type of open country that they, uh, they require has uh, caused their populations to drop. Another bird, uh, this is our only kite in the region, is a white-tailed kite. You'll often see them hovering. These are a year-round resident and they, they nest in a stick nest in the tree the, uh, of, the, of the hawks that we'll be talking about. The, the harrier is the only one that nests on the ground. The others all nest, nest in uh, trees or uh, at least her tall bushes. The uh, white-tailed kite's a year-round resident and in the winter time they'll often form communal roosts, so uh, pretty interesting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit. I think I've laid a lot of kind of foundation for what uh, uh, you know I'm gonna discuss through the rest of the talk. So I'm not gonna say as much. You know, again, we could uh, you know each one of these species could des deserves their own talk, but we're just giving a nice uh, survey of our birds of prey. So ospreys are a species that's really increasing. So it's not all bad news. There's uh, good news and bad news. And uh, ospreys, bald eagles, and peregrine falcons, you know, 25 years ago, none of them nested in around Sacramento, and now they all do. And that's largely because of the banning of DDT. DDT thinned their egg shells and made it so they you know, couldn't successfully rear young or hatch young. And uh, ospreys are... Uh, fish eaters, and you can see in the lower right, well, the, both pictures on the right, they have um, fish. They plunge into the water and grab fish. It's pretty impressive. You know, they're a big raptor, and it's really, uh, you know, both them splashing down, and then when they take off and they kind of shake off like a dog to get the, get some of the water off. It's pretty impressive. Uh, you know, watching them feed sometimes isn't for the faint of heart because a lot of the fish are still partially alive and they, they just start eating them and it uh, can be pretty gruesome. But they're, uh, they're a beautiful, interesting bird and they're, they're doing better. So that's, that is some good news. Uh, the two eagles, um, the golden eagle, open country bird, and as you might expect, their populations are declining. The bald eagles are uh, more of a wetland associated bird and a scavenger. Their populations are increasing and uh, largely, again, because I mentioned the DDT. These birds are similar in some ways. They're very large raptors. Uh, oftentimes, you know, you'll, you'll see, uh, huge raptor, but uh, judging size in the field can be really difficult uh, because of angle and lighting and other objects around. Sometimes your impression can be thrown off, but when you see like there's a red-tailed hawk soaring near it again, we'll do a little quick red-tailed hawk ID. You've got the you know dark patagium and the belly band. Uh, 
it appears to be a, a subadult. I don't see any reddish in the tail, though uh, sometimes it doesn't show from the underside very well unless the light is shining through it. But anyway, that's a quick aside. But you can see, okay, red-tailed hawk or a raven, which is about the size of a red-tailed hawk, uh, oftentimes they'll be harassing the golden eagles and uh, they're dwarfed by the golden eagle. So, uh, so here's a juvenile in the middle. They have uh, dark white uh, in the inner part of the wing and then uh, white and a lot of white in the tail and then the adult on the left. Contrasting them with the bald eagles, they're, uh, they look smaller headed and longer tailed. Um, the bald eagles have massive bills and relatively shorter tails, so they look uh, much more symmetrical in the air, like their head and tail isn't that much different. The tail's a little longer than the head projection, but it, it gives that impression. Um, this Sounds like somebody should mute themselves. I'm getting some uh, feedback or other conversation. So um, also the, the it takes the uh, bald eagles uh, four to five years to look like the national bird. Uh, when they're uh, younger birds in their first, uh, especially their first couple years, they're really heavily modeled, uh, look really messy. Uh, but again, this bird in the lower right, you can just see this massive bill. Almost looks uh, kind of prehistoric. So now, uh, for the Bufferlands perspective, we have, I don't know, probably few, fewer than 20 records anyway in, you know, 30 years of Ferruginous Hawk. They're not common on the Bufferlands. But in the East County, out around Rancho Marietta, Deer Creek Hills, Meese Road, there, uh, you know, you can go out on a good day, see five or six. Um, beautiful hawk, uh, like it's a, in the Budio uh, genus, uh, but it it's, almost seems uh, like it's partway toward a, an eagle. It's bigger than a red tail. Um, these are birds that have feathered Parsi, their uh, their legs. I mean, not to get too picky, but actually, these are so. We have a lot of the same bones in our body as birds do, and this what looks like a bird's leg, you know. And here's its knee, but it bends backward. This is equivalent to our foot. Uh, this is the tarsus or uh, tarso metatarsus to be more precise. And then the uh, the this is their heel joint really and then the upper leg is is the um what equivalent to our shin bones but anyway the for all intents and purposes they these are considered legs and their feet are the equivalent to our toes but they have feathers on them if you go back like the uh you can't really see it in the picture but the um like the osprey they don't have feathered legs which makes sense because they're you know, diving into water, they're getting wet all the time. Same thing with uh, the bald eagles, but the, the golden eagles do have uh, feathered tarsi, feathered uh, legs. So the, the young birds are much paler than the adults. The adults have these uh, uh, rufousy uh, drumsticks, which uh, really uh, they look like a, a V when they're overhead. Uh, really huge long gape that goes almost to the back of the eye. These birds hunt a lot of ground squirrels and so they have this big mouth to choke down ground squirrels. And a similar bird within similar habitat, which is more uh, variable uh, in seasonality is the uh, red-shouldered hawk. Uh, the kind of classic look of red-shouldered hawk so the dark belly and then uh, dark dark wrists with a with a whitish tail below and then the, the heavy uh, band just called a subterminal band because there's a little bit of white right at the tip. Uh, this is an adult male probably. They're not as heavily 
marked and then their tail is from the upper side is more banded. These can give you the feel of a Swainson's hawk, but they're a bit, it's like a Swainson's hawk with a heavy coat on. They have a similar a bit small looking bill. The gape doesn't go as far back as like on the um, virginous hawk. Uh, this is kind of classic them with small feet. They'll perch on top of a pole. You'd never see, rarely even see a red tail perch like this. Uh, these are a relatively big uh, long winged hawk, but they, uh, um, this is very characteristic and this dark belly. Uh, kind of a white mottled head. I could say more, but I'm going to have to move move along here. So turkey vultures, there was a while uh, when I first really started getting into birds, they were saying maybe these were more closely related to storks than they were uh, to hawks, uh, some of the early DNA techniques. But now it's been pretty well established that they're they're distinct, but they're more closely related to hawks than anything else. You know, the, the vultures are in their own family along with the condors, but their nearest next relatives are, are the hawks. Warming up in the sun. Going to go out and, uh, you know, they don't have to get up early in the morning. They uh, use the sun to warm up and then they'll go out and uh, use uh, their sense of smell to find prey. Very highly developed sense of smell in vultures. And they're, you know, as I'm sure all of you know, they're scavengers, hence the bald head to keep them clean. So falcons, um, these again, uh, I remember as a kid, seeing one and thinking uh, the first one I was like 11 or 12 and I told my dad I think I had saw a parrot and it turned out it was a what he called a sparrow hawk at the time but now they're called American kestrels uh, and is it you know it was just kind of a lucky coincidence I think I didn't I wasn't a budding junior taxonomist uh, it just was a colorful bird but uh, it turns out that they are uh, falcons are closely related to parrots. This is a male here with a uh, dark band near the tip of the tail and the slaty on the wings, spots below, and here's a female in the lower right. Uh, she has more of a barred tail and uh, streaks instead of spots and doesn't have the slaty gray. I like to play this little video. Uh, you can see how the bird holds its head steady in the wind. Uh, it's pretty impressive. So moving on to Merlin, this is a little bigger than a kestrel, but they're much more powerful flyers. These are another uh, winter resident. We'll start getting them in October and, you know, see the last ones for the year in April. Uh, this one looks like it has a, I think it's an immature white crowned sparrow. They're a very effective predator, uh, very fast flyers. Uh, peregrine and prairie falcon. Uh, peregrine again is a bird I've mentioned as doing better. They're actually nesting locally now. Prairie falcon, open country bird, appears to be declining. We used to see prairie falcon almost every day on the buffer lands and now we don't. We see them occasionally and we used to almost never get peregrine falcons and now we see them regularly. So that's a, a, been a big change. Moving on to owls, um, we have a barn owl, year-round resident, cavity nester. Uh, they, we have quite a few uh, nest boxes for them, which they readily take to. They'll also take to wood duck boxes, but they fill them up. Their wood duck boxes are small for a barn owl, and they'll fill them up with, you know, sometimes six, eight, ten young. 
and they also uh, regurgitate their pellets inside and literally fill the box with uh, it's such a beautiful bird, but their housekeeping is, is horrendous. Our biggest, toughest uh, raptor, or at least owl, and I'd say toughest raptor, uh, even including the eagles, is the uh, great horned owl. Um, they're pretty common on the property. We usually have, you know, four or five nests, and they're, they're a lot of fun to watch. Year-round resident. Very rarely we have two records, both in the fall, of long-eared owls. This is a poorly understood and declining species. Uh, Short-eared owls, we have maybe a dozen, maybe fewer records, fewer lately. Um, they are closely related. Uh, and then I put the western screech owl just for regional relevance. We haven't found one yet on the property. I'm hoping uh, to see one like this. This is sticking its head out of a of a nest box along the American River Parkway, but uh, they're more in the foothills and a few records at Cosumnes River Preserve, but uh, even around uh, Sacramento uh, in some places in town, uh, they nest in tree cavities. Uh, these guys are stick nesters, and then the uh, shorted owls like the Northern Harrier nest on the ground. Burrowing owl, this is um, you know, one of our favorites at the Bufferlands. We've done a lot of work to improve habitat for burrowing owls, and sadly, they've still declined. They used to breed uh, several pairs on the property. Now, only every few years uh, they, are they breeding, and then they're wintering in lower numbers. We used to have you know, 10 to a dozen, and you know, back. Uh, 25 years ago, even more. And this year we've only had four or five. Uh, and they usually show up in in October and are around into uh, end of March, into April. And then some years they will, you know, uh, they'll pair up and, and breed. Just a few pictures. Here's some young birds in the upper left. Very long legs. Uh, last last year, last fall, we released a, a, an owl, a rehabbed owl, onto the property in one of our artificial burrows. And uh, Stan Wright helped us out by putting a, a identifiable band on the bird that we could monitor it. And unfortunately for us, I think the owl may be just fine, but it moved on after about two and a half weeks. Um, one of the mornings I went out to check on it, this Cooper's Hawk was hanging out right by the entrance uh, and the owl had retreated inside. And then later on he popped out. But uh, I, we don't know where this bird went and we haven't re-sighted it. But um, that was an interesting process to uh, add one owl to the population. And just very quickly, uh, shrikes, they're sort of uh, honorary raptor. Loggerhead shrikes, another declining species. Uh, uh, probably a combination of loss of open space. A lot of insectivorous birds uh, are declining and just as a class of birds from songbirds to nighthawks to shrikes, which are not just insectivorous, they'll also eat rodents and lizards, uh, they're really impressive. They're a songbird, but they uh, act like a raptor. And most people who do raptor surveys and counting raptors, they also count shrikes while they're at it because even though they're a songbird, they're an honorary raptor. And we have one record of Northern Shrike. Uh, uh, my coworker, Steve Scott, found one uh, several years back now. And that was a great addition to our bird list. And so for more information, you can go to our website, has our bird lists and all sorts of information about the background of the bufferlands. And with that, I will open things up for questions.